If you've ever heard of people talk about in-groups versus out-groups, tribalism, or an us-versus-them mentality, we can understand those concepts through an influential theory in social psychology called social identity theory. So let's start with the basics. What do we mean by social identities? To find out, I talked to Dr. Jay Van Bavel, a psychology professor at NYU and an expert on social identity theory. And so it's basically changing uh, the way we think about ourselves from uh, me to we. And when you have that social identity activated, so for example, I'm Canadian and I've been watching the World Junior Hockey Championship, which probably means almost nothing to anybody who listens to this <laughs> podcast, unless you're Canadian and it's like this, this uh, tradition around Christmas. And when I watch it and I see all these players in the red with the Maple Leafs on their jerseys and they play the national anthem after the game, I'm, I'm thinking about myself as a Canadian. So I'm, I'm a fluid person. I'm a somewhat of a social chameleon, just like we all are, in that whichever person I'm interacting with or when I'm watching on TV or interacting, how I'm interacting with people on social media activates different types of uh, shared identities that I have with people. And then I see myself in a different way and think in a different way and act in a different way. So again, our social identities are the parts of us defined by the groups that we belong to. And this gives us a handy set of terms for talking about things. First, in-groups are the groups you belong to. They are your social identities. Your hometown, religious affiliation, school, those are your in-groups. They're part of who you are. So then out-groups are the groups we don't belong to. Like, I'm from the United States, and so for me, Canadians are my out-group. Growing up, I was a Cubs fan, and so Sox fans would be my outgroup. Now, I gave some relatively innocuous examples of in-groups and out-groups, and it's just to make the point that this is all just a basic way that our brain thinks about our social identities. But of course, the kinds of identities we're often more interested in are things like racial, gender, and sexual identities. And researchers have even recently started looking at politics as an important social identity. For example, the animosity that we're seeing between Democrats and Republicans in the United States may, in part, be a case of social identity theory in action. Because all of this commingling of our identity, the people in our in-groups, the people in our out-groups, it can make for some trouble. And to understand why, we need to acknowledge that people oftentimes want to see themselves positively. We like our self-esteem to be high, generally. And one place we get our self-esteem is from our social identities. I get to feel good when I belong to a group that is good. It's a concept called basking in reflected glory. And some of the earliest evidence for it came from research on sports fandom. They tracked college students at seven different universities over the course of a football season. And in particular, they were paying attention to what these students were wearing. The Monday after a school's football team won a game, Students were wearing university apparel all over the place. But the Monday after a school's football team lost a game, there was nary a university logo to be found on campus. In later experiments, they would ask students to describe a game that their school's football team had won. And in those cases, students would say things like, we made a lot of great plays. But when they instead asked them to describe a game that their school's team had lost, they say things like, yeah, they fumbled the ball a lot. The idea is that we take our group's virtues as our own. We use our group's successes to fuel our own self-esteem. But the connection between how we see ourselves and how we see our groups, it's a two-way street. Uh, one of the core reasons we identify with groups is because it makes us feel better about ourselves. We want to be part of distinctive, uh, positively distinctive groups, groups that are doing well in society. Um, you know, you don't want to often identify with low status groups. Uh, and in fact, people will shift how they identify to align with, you know, I, I have the flexibility, as I said, to identify as a Canadian, as an academic, as a dad, um, as an Ohio State alumnus. And that might shift depending on uh, what's going on in the world. So. So while basking in reflected glory is a way for us to gain self-esteem from our groups being good, 
our need for self-esteem can also warp the way we see our groups to begin with. You can think of it like a simple logic problem. I'm a good person, and I belong to this group. Therefore, that group must be good. After all, what's a good guy like me doing in a bad group? It's got to be the good group. This results in two key biases, in-group favoritism and out-group derogation. In-group favoritism just means that all else equal, we have a bias to see our in-groups positively. And out-group derogation is just the opposite, our bias to see out-groups negatively. And both of these biases can serve our self-esteem, either by convincing ourselves that we belong to the good group, or that at least we don't belong to the bad group. Okay, so this can be pretty tricky to study, because after all, social identity theory says that just belonging to a group, any group, is enough to kick this stuff into motion. But of course, the kinds of prejudice we're usually interested in understanding are dripping with history, preconceptions, struggles for power. So how can we strip away all the baggage that comes with our identities and test the very simple prediction that simply associating with any group is enough to create discrimination? Now, it turns out there's a pretty simple, elegant way to do this. And it goes back to the research of a guy named Henri Tajfel. Tajfel was born in 1919 into a Jewish family in Poland. In the 30s, he went to study chemistry in France and later joined the French military during the Second World War. He was captured by the Germans and survived as a prisoner of war. The rest of his family wasn't so lucky. After the war, Tajfel discovered that his whole immediate family and many of his friends had been killed by Nazis in the Holocaust. And in the wake of such an enormous tragedy, Tajfel couldn't shake the question, how could this happen? What gives rise to this kind of hatred between groups? As an aside, it's worth noting that despite his painful history and his contributions to understanding prejudice, it's recently been highlighted that Tajfel was frequently engaged in sexual harassment against young women at his university. And even though gender is a social identity like any other, Tajfel was resolutely uninterested in applying social identity theory to understanding gender dynamics. Anyhow, by the 1960s, Tajfel had started to study social psychology, and at the time, psychologists had a few ideas about where prejudice comes from. Some of the research was focused on personality traits that are related to prejudice, other research was looking at how things like frustration can make people lash out aggressively at other people, but Tajfel just wanted to start from scratch. He thought, let's conduct an experiment where we create totally random, arbitrary, meaningless groups. We'll establish a baseline for when there are groups, but no prejudice, and then we'll slowly layer meaning onto those groups until we see prejudice emerge. Then we'll really understand things. But it turned out Tajfel never had to add any meaning to those groups. He found that just creating groups, any group, arbitrarily, was enough for prejudice to emerge. Yeah, in, in many ways, the minimal groups are like one of the most interesting control conditions in the history of social science. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at one example of how he did this. I'm about to show you a random set of dots on the screen, and I just want you to guess how many dots there are. And, and really do this. M make a guess. Ready? Woo! Okay, how many do you think there were? The right answer is 36. Now, it turns out that some people have a tendency to overestimate numbers in games like this. So if you guessed a number above 36, that makes you an overestimator. But other people have a tendency to underestimate numbers in games like this. So if you guessed a number below 36, that makes you an underestimator. And this is exactly what Tajfel did to create groups. Based on totally artificial, meaningless information, he was able to assign people to a social identity, either as an overestimator or an underestimator. And here's the thing. I lied to you. <laughs> there were not 36 dots on the screen. So the group you think you belong to is even more bogus than you realized. But in his experiments, he would tell people that they had to decide how much money to give to other participants in the study. And all people saw were a couple random ID numbers and whether they belonged to overestimators or underestimators. Sure enough, 
despite only knowing meaningless information about strangers they would never meet. People who thought they were overestimators tended to give more money to their fellow overestimators at the expense of underestimators, and vice versa. This kind of study came to be known as the minimal group paradigm, because they were creating groups out of basically nothing. Groups that had nothing to do with the kinds of decisions that people would end up having to make. And yet, over and over and over again, studies have shown that these dumb little identities lead to discrimination. Okay, before we wrap up, there's a couple issues that I want to consider. I've given you the classic version of social identity theory, and it's held up pretty well. One of the great things about social identity, it was developed in the 70s, you know, the minimal group studies uh, are turning 50 years old this year. Hmm. And so it is one of those, uh, mo you know, one of the most foundational insights and set of studies and launched this whole theoretical framework. But in all of that time, we've made some refinements. One interesting point that I like to emphasize is that bias can come from in-group favoritism by itself, out-group derogation by itself, or both at the same time. And when researchers have looked closely at how much of prejudice is due to each of these biases, they actually find that it's in-group favoritism that often carries more of the blame. After all, we know it's wrong to dislike someone because of the group they belong to, but it doesn't always feel nearly as wrong to go out of your way to help someone a little extra because they're connected to you somehow. Now, this isn't to say, of course, that outgroup derogation never happens, and it's also definitely not to excuse in-group favoritism. However you slice the prejudice pie, it's still prejudice pie. And why do you have prejudice pie in the first place? The other refinement has to do with the self-esteem stuff I made a big deal about. The early days of social identity theory really emphasized how our need to feel good about ourselves fuels this kind of discrimination. But when researchers have looked more closely at the evidence, self-esteem isn't always a clear culprit. So even though these social identity biases show up again and again and again, the exact reason why is still something we're testing. In the end, social identity theory has been a powerful force in the study of prejudice and discrimination. Sheerly by virtue of having social identities, our psychology sets us up to see the world in terms of us versus them, which can have some pretty ugly consequences. Now, it's important to note that social identity theory is not all you need to make sense of prejudice. Things like racism and sexism go way deeper than simple social identity, and I'm not trying to say that racism is equivalent to prejudice against overestimators. But the research in social identity makes it clear that it does at least have a small but reliable role in the social biases that we see. And it's given us some ideas about how to address those biases. But more on that later. Thanks for watching. To learn more about this topic, you can check out my podcast, Opinion Science, where you can find the full interview with Dr. J. Van Bavel about social identity theory and all sorts of other topics in the world of our opinions and how they change. So subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to this YouTube channel for more about social psychology, and I'll see you next time.